antique heritage as animals. They are the animals in our brain. Well, Plato knew what you and I both should know as well. There are animals in the brain. We have to learn to tame them. That's our job. That's absolutely our job if we want to be moral beings. If the evil and violence inherent in our nature is a creative force, ultimately, then why would living peacefully really be desirable? That's a very good question, because if you live peacefully in a way that freezes the evolutionary mechanism so that there is no new creativity, uh, then you've done a terrible thing indeed. You've monkey-wrenched the works. Um, but the fact is that we have many ways of competing that substitute for violence and, in fact, are far more productive than violence. For example, which accomplished more, the battle with um, Japan in the Second World War or the battle with Japan since the Second World War, which has been an economic battle, a battle of ideas, and a battle of organizational forms? Well, actually, we learned a hell of a lot from both battles. We invented radar during the Second World War. We invented quite a few other things during the Second World War under pressure. The Japanese invented just-in-time inventorying systems. The Japanese invented way of mobilizing their workers, so they, instead of imposing the General Motors style of uh, industrial organization, where all ideas come down from above, the Japanese managed to pull ideas from below, where people were actually in contact with the day-to-day -day problems of how to produce a product. We learned how to pull that from the Japanese. So our competition with the Japanese has been at least as productive as our violent battle with the Japanese during the Second World War, and probably infinitely more productive. If we concentrate on economic competitions and creative competitions, we can, I believe, accomplish even more than was accomplished once upon a time with the old-style system of physical destruction, physical, physical competition. competition. I was wondering if I could ask you to put your profits goggles on and tell me what you see in 20 years time for the human race. Well, unfortunately, I see two things happening simultaneously and a lot is going to depend on you and me. I put together a book outline in 1985 complete with the research called The Return of the Middle Ages, Sexual Terror and the Fear of Knowledge. Um, it basically said that people are going to go back into what uh, Faith Popcorn calls cocooning that they're going to respond to globalism with tribalism. And in the process of responding to globalism with tribalism, a set of internal hormones would take over. And that, that set of internal hormones closes us down to novelty, closes us down to knowledge, and makes us retreat within ourselves makes us retreat to dream worlds within ourselves. Ideas of flying saucer people coming to save us, ideas of spirituality. I mean, ideas of spirituality are basically ideas that are fantasies. They involve withdrawing into yourself and believing in a heaven and a hell that we've never seen and have no evidence for, whereas in other periods of history, people become curious about the outside world rather than retreating to these inside fantasies. Well, I see us retreating to these inside fantasies. The fantasies of the day when Kosovo was the Jerusalem of the Serbs. Um, the fantasies of the days when the Aryan race ruled. These are the kinds of fantasies that are dominating people now, and you can see them in the hate groups that you've tracked. I mean, you've been a very instrumental figure in tracking the fringe groups. That's, that's the group where the new passions of the next generation are seething and boiling right now. Those are the groups which will someday move to the center and take over if we don't watch out. And they are hate groups. They are hate groups with ancient tribalisms. And they are violently against science. And they're out there all over the place. These are the new tribalisms. But there is another possibility. And I've only seen it recently. And I've seen it because some of the meetings that you and I have had with various people under the age of 20. I've seen that those people have this massive hole in their soul and they have built their personalities around cynicism. Cynicism means simply aping or putting into an ironic form, mocking existing institutions instead of building institutions of your own. What I've discovered is because these people have such a deep need for something to believe in, that if someone like you who has a powerful set of beliefs or someone like I, who has a powerful set of beliefs. I mean, I'm, I've been searching the gods all my life. Now I know them, the gods inside of us, or I feel I do. Um, someone like me or you, who can come along and show these people that there is a meaning to life, that there are things worth believing in, 
that there are things worth being passionate about, they respond immediately. Now, we're either going to have the new Adolf Hitlers coming along who know how to manipulate this need and do it with the new nationalisms and the new tribalisms and the new hate groups, or we're going to have a you or a me who will come along and pour a positive message, a positive sense of something to believe in, a positive crusade for emotionality. I've always thought there was something of the Messiah in you, Howard. Well, there has to be something of the Messiah because the only Messiahs who exist are us human beings. We human beings are all basically cockroaches at heart. That is to say, we're insecure, when we're alone by ourselves, we have all kinds of self-doubts, we have our depressions, and we have all kinds of reasons to believe that we're nobody at all. But it's nobodies at all who become the Isaiahs of the world. It's the nobodies at all who become the Einsteins of the world. It's the nobodies at all who become the Jesus Christs of the world. And it's incumbent on us, having learned the lesson, that we've been able to learn a lesson from the history of Christianity. Jesus put together a movement that was based on respect for the humble and the poor, on seeing their possibilities, on seeing that they had to be treated as human beings too. What happened to his message? When it was taken over 322 years later by Constantine, Constantine had the, the cross painted on the shields of his men. And suddenly, Christianity became an excuse for mass murder. Christ would never have allowed that. Okay, we know that now. And we know that Christ was just as human as anything, anybody else. Why did he cry out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? When he was on the cross. Because he was insecure about everything he had believed in up till then. He was as human as we are. It's up to human beings to be the messiahs. We're the only ones who are there to do it. And we have to do it. We have to do it. Because if we don't do it, somebody with an equal belief and passion to ours, who believes that the way to achieve things is through the old animal way, the old animal way built into our limbic system, built into the lower parts of our brain, to you know, who, who knows that the best way to unite people is by uniting them in hatred against an outside group and uniting them in mass murder. We have to come along before that person comes along. We have to fill that void and we have to fill it with positivity. It's about going, digging in to the elemental passions. The mandate of paleopsychology is to trace the evolution of thought, of mentation, and emotion from the first 10 to the minus 30 seconds of the Big Bang on up to the present. And to trace social phenomena from the moment of the Big Bang up to the present. All of this plays a part in trying to give to the new generation a movement that's based on something extraordinarily passionate that you can powerfully believe in, that you can use to advance humanity tremendously, absolutely tremendously, but that excises deliberately the god of war. When you find the gods inside yourself, you'll find the god of war. You'll find the god of bloodlust. You'll find the god of genocide. And he will be one of the most powerful passions in you. And you have to knife him out of existence. You have to freeze him in his own private hell and make your positive gods the gods that take you over. And by the gods that take you over, I mean you have to find those passions that are so much more powerful in you than anything you've been allowed to express in your life and making those things the things you work on. In other words, not putting off until you're 40 or 50 the things you feel passionate about at the age of 15 and 16, but going directly to those things and trying to implement them when you're 20. Pass, go. Forget the $200. Go directly to Park Place and put your life there on the line with all the emotion and power and passion and insight in you. And fuck the god of war. This is the Dream Machine, a kinetic sculpture designed to be looked at with your eyes closed. Invented by painter Brian Geisen, the Dream Machine projects psychedelic patterns onto your eyelids, which then get projected directly into your mind. After about 25 minutes with the Dream Machine, the user experiences a fall into a tunnel of color, shapes, and swirling visuals. 
Egyptian hieroglyphics, cave paintings, and day-glow mandalas are common motifs and experiences with the dream machine, but more esoteric results can also occur. Touted as a drugless turn-on during the 1960s, the dream machine was patented by Geisen but never made in great number due to the cost of production. That's all changed recently due to the efforts of Los Angeles-based composer David Woodard, which you can read about at his davidwoodard.com website. Author William Burroughs thought the dream machine was a creativity enhancer and called it a cure for writer's block. Kurt Cobain owned a dream machine, Iggy Pop owns one, and Genesis Peorage, a close friend of Geisen's, published a blueprint of the machine during his Temple of Psychic Youth days. It's worth mentioning here that Nostradamus got his prophetic visions using a trick similar to the way the dream machine works, that involves staring at the sun. Can you see the future with a dream machine too? For more information on the Dream Machine, the music of David Woodard and his other strange science fiction devices like the Wishing Machine, check out davidwoodard.com. How do you think the invention of the internet will cause mutation in the human race? Well, I mean, one thing that uh, is often discussed is how marriages are breaking up now because of online romance. Marriage is obviously going to change dramatically. Male-female relationships are going to change dramatically. Males and females are able to find themselves on the basis of the synchronicity of their souls. Now, back to the red and the yellow um, sponges again. And the fact that the red, those red independent cells manage to find other red independent cells and form a community, and yellow independent cells manage to find yellow independent cells and find a community. Well, we have a huge porridge of individuals. We have been sieved as thoroughly as the sponges were sieved uh, by the internet. And we've been allowed to then find our way to people who resonate to our frequency in some deep, deep emotional way.